Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Welcome to Village Square Booksellers in Bellows Falls. This is kind of exciting. This is our second live event. Um, we were only allowed to have eight people in the room, including us, up until July 1st. So this is kind of amazing to have all of you <laughs> nice people here. So um, I'm welcoming my old friend Bill. He's one of the first people I met here at a chamber mixer over at uh, Bill and Genevieve's back in July of 99, I think it was, and he was involved in the Our Town, uh, some, the Our Town uh, group and the Front Porch Theater at the time. And since then, he's turned his hand to, to writing, and we have a lot of different examples of what he's been writing the last few years. And this was last year's book, which we could only do a virtual event on unfortunately. And then this is this year's book. And this year is, it's dear to my heart because Alan and I lived in France and uh, spent a lot of time in Paris on our barge, our Dutch barge. And we're I'm looking forward to hearing about his newest book. So take it away, Bill. <laughs> Yay! Yay. <laughs> First, thank you all for coming. I'd say merci in the rest of it, but I don't know any French. <laughs> <laughs> My wife, Jean, does. If, if, now, just one question. Is there anyone here who was in France, in Paris in 1941? <laughs> Good. Then you won't know that I got it wrong. <laughs> Because of my voice, I'm going to introduce my wife, Jeannie, who will introduce my readers, all friends from the theater and the writing world. Bonsoir and bienvenue, which is welcome in French. And so tonight we have a group of um, local um, arts people. And um, uh, first we have Ed uh, Charbonneau and um, who's also our neighbor, and um, Ed Gulo, <laughs> and, his, and his lovely wife, Eileen <laughs> Charbonneau. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Um, and um, so Eileen, um, they, are, they live in Bellows Falls, and Eileen is also an author. You may have heard of her. She's written quite a few books. And, um, and in fact, when we did the Zoom uh, joint session in, the winter, um, it was uh, her book and Bill's that were that were featured, and this is Todd Hutchinson, and he is uh, from the Springfield Players, and um, he's done a lot of shows. He's directed. I think we've directed. Have you I was directed? supposed to direct, but you were that supposed to got direct. canceled. So he's COVID. he's been in um, <laughs> been in some <laughs> different productions and been very involved in the um, in the running of Springfield Players and. Um, we're expecting um, Samara Aldrich, and she is very involved with River, both River Theater and Walpole Players. And um, I'm not sure um, if she's gonna make it or not, um, but her, her part is number five, so um, if she doesn't make it by then, guess who will be reading that? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm Jeannie Levesque, and um, I've been involved in a bunch of, just about every theater around. Um, so, um, without any further ado, we'll start with um, with uh, our first our first reader. Oh. That's me. Um, can I take this off to read? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh wait a minute. He's got. We both have one. Oh, um, you have that one. Okay. <laughs> okay. So just go right into it. My apologies. I've never done a book read. There's a few. Excerpts from the book. <laughs> Mary O'Reilly was a college student in Boston, even though it was the mid-1930s and the country was in the throes of the Great Depression. 
Unlike many students who came from other cities and places and lived in dorms, Mary commuted to her classes every day from her parents' house, where she had grown up in working class South Boston. Like most of the population of that area, she was of Irish Catholic ancestry. She was a bright student, and the nuns, who were her teachers, had found a way for her to get a scholarship and complete college. They were, of course, expecting her to become a teacher and marry and become a pillar of their Catholic community. Somehow, the good sisters had missed the fact that their good student also had a sense of adventure. Mary studied art. One day, her portrait teacher, Madame Blanchette, who had come to the U.S. as an adult, said to her, Mary, you are so good, you need to study in Paris with the really good teachers, and besides, in Paris, you will really learn of the world. And that seed of an idea grew. One of the many boyfriends Mary seemed to easily attract was for, for what woof, was from Quebec in French Canada. Mary had taken French in high school, and she began speaking it with Pierre. Then she started speaking it with Madame Blanchette as well. The older woman laughed at first, then became serious, correcting Mary's pronunciation away from the Quebecois accent of Pierre to that of true Parisian. Pierre remained skeptical. How will you ever afford to go to Paris, he asked her. Mary smiled. My father runs a pub. The end of pro prohibition greatly helped his business. People like to drink. They always find money for that, and I can work for him as a waitress. What about being a teacher, Pierre asked. Mary laughed. I will come back and teach when I'm older, like Madame Blanchette. Then she added, after I'm a famous artist. Hmm. OK, Pierre said. He accepted her dream. Mary's mother wasn't so easily convinced. Why can't you just study art in Boston, she kept asking. To that, Mary just kept rolling her eyes. She called herself Marie when she got to Paris. She had picked a bad time to do it, though. It was 1938, and the clouds of war were gathering over Europe and actually all over the rest of the world as well. But Paris was still very much the place where the great artists had gone for the last 50 years before. A golden age for them there. Sidewalk cafes abounded. The weather and the world most often felt grand, and enjoyment and fun sparkled in so many eyes. She studied art at the School of the Fifth Arrondissement on the left bank always with the hope of getting her work in some gallery or perhaps a student exhibition and selling the occasional work to a tourist on the street. Marie supported herself by modeling for classes at the school. Her classic nude appearance was quite popular with the students. The work was certainly more glamorous than being a waitress in her father's Irish pub. She also discovered the club life of pre-war Paris, and for about a year she lived a wonderfully scandalous life they would have appalled the good nuns of Boston. <laughs> the everyday effects of the change were slow at first. The Germans did not invade for months, though a giant French army stood firmly at the border. In many ways, the club life continued on. Who wouldn't want to still live in Paris, after all? Even with the world of arts and beauty slowly crashing down, going home to working class South Boston seemed hardly an option to Marie really now. That world all seemed so far away and long ago. The art school began to lose students, and it suddenly closed. Maurice saw her friends less and less. Maurice had gone the way of any number of other casual boyfriends. Some went to homes in other countries, some went off to the war, and some to other pursuits seemingly more urgent than the world of art. Still, Maurice stayed on. Marie wished very much to continue living in her tiny apartment off Avenue Le Grand Rollin near the Pont d'Austerlitz, a bridge that crossed the Seine and close to the Gare de Lyon, the train station that connected Paris with the city of Lyon to the south and all the little stops in between. She had come to depend on her concierge, Madame Gagnon. The older woman knew where Marie could get anything. Marie even thought of stopping by the nearby church and praying to the god the nuns had taught her to pray to do so. To, to, so that her good life would continue, even if such a life would be totally strange to the nuns she had known. Madame Bouchard, proprietor of the bread shop near her apartment, noticed Marie's dejected demeanor in the days after her school closed when she came in for her daily baguette. It was one of Marie's favorite spots. All the staff recognized her and treated her as if she were every bit of Parisian as they were. The smell of fresh baked bread always permeated the air and the pastries on display always seemed so inviting, so delicious, 
and so naughty when indulged. Mm -hmm. Marie confessed all that was going on to the empathetic proprietor. Ah, the war, Madame Bouchard said in a tone of resignation. She was definitely old enough to have been running the shop through the big war about 20 years before that. You must now find work. In fact, my niece has just left. You have seen her many times, no? Marie nodded. She assumed the older woman was referring to a younger woman who had often waited on her in the store. That boy she says she loves has taken her off to Marseille. You have been a very good customer this past year or more. Your French has become very good. I have come to like you. Would you like to have her job? Marie easily said yes. Then Marie discovered that Madame de Bouchard had become much more than just a bakery proprietor. Overnight and right under her nose, the older woman became well connected to the resistance that quickly arose. Marie wasn't actually recruited to help Madame Bouchard with the resistance business. It just naturally became part of her job. The offerings and choices at the bakery became less and ingredients became harder to get, as did garlic, cheese, and pork. But Madame Bouchard kept her staff well fed, occasionally having an unexpected bounty when some messenger on resistance business from the countryside brought some fresh fruits, vegetables, perhaps a freshly killed chicken. Marie often found herself at the bakery, waiting on customers, getting their bread for the evening meal, and also waiting for someone with resistance business. Most were quick and businesslike, wanting to get where they were going well before the curfews the Nazis had imposed on the city. Though not sure what might happen if they were caught out late, none of them wanted to find out. One late afternoon, an older man entered the shop. He was one of the regulars dressed as a laborer. In fact, he came in every day, and she knew he worked for the railroad. He came directly up to the counter opposite where Marie stood and pulled a folded up piece of paper from his pocket. Here is my mother's order for tomorrow, he said. Oui, she acknowledged. I have three baguettes your mother ordered for today. The man handed her the note and she handed him back the three baguettes she had said his mother had ordered. In almost the same motion, Marie slipped the note into the side pocket of her skirt, just under the edge of her apron. The man nodded, turned, and left. Marie said a quick, uh, oh, pardon, to the woman who would have been her next customer, and went quickly through the curtain door to the rear of the shop. Madame Bouchard looked up from an order she was assembling. Marie said, he has come. Madame Bouchard nodded and said, they called. Today, it is by the corner of the Pont Austerlust. Then she hurried by Marie to take him over from behind the counter of the shop. Marie untied and took off her apron. Then she found her purse. She rummaged around and pulled out a, French, a pack of French Galois cigarettes. About a half a pack remained. She took one and lit it, and she smoked nervously for a full minute or two. Then she took the paper the man had given her from her pocket, and she rolled it tightly so it would fit into the pack with the remaining cigarettes. Then she shook and squeezed the pack so that only the ends of the cigarettes would show. She put the pack back in her purse, and she let herself out the rear door of the shop and hurried on her way. Even though by now she had done it many times before, Marie was anxious, as well as now being in possession of a note that would likely get her arrested if it was found. She was also anxious to get back to the shop, to finish up for the day and get back to her apartment before curfew time. The sun was still shining, though the evening approached. The trees along the streets were all green and the sky was blue. As she walked along, she wondered if maybe she should have put on her coat. It had been a beautiful, warm spring Paris day, but she saw some other women wearing light coats and the last thing she wanted was to stand out from the others around her. She had noted how women in Paris seemed determined to remain fashionable, despite the dreary mood of the occupation. Their attitude and clothes they wore were a subtle sign to the Germans that the spirit of Paris had not been conquered. No matter, she thought. There were others without coats as well. 
Now, carrying some sort of secret message in her purse, she was even more wary of any German soldiers or the collaborating gendarmes on the street. Her student papers would be of no help if they found that message in her cigarette pack. She had been given a plan. If she saw them stopping people, she would stop, light a cigarette from her pack, then as unobtrusively as possible, she would drop the pack and move on. Important information might be lost, but she would remain safe and free to deliver more. Marie reached the bridge, and she spotted a man she had met many times before. He wore a wide-brimmed fedora, as was the fashion of the day. It was brown and matched his simple suit and dark red broad tie. Again, a person that absolutely did not stand out. He stood just a little way onto the bridge, leaning on the rail and looking down on something below. Marie walked past him. Then, just a few meters beyond, she stopped, turned to face the rail as well. She pulled the cigarette pack from her purse and lit a cigarette. She held the pack in her hand and rested on the rail. She too looked off in the distance, beyond the bridge. Then the man walked toward her. Marie saw his movement out of the corner of her eye, but she did not look around. When he reached her, he stopped and asked if she could spare an extra cigarette for him. We, oui, Marie said, without emotion, nor a smile. She handed the cigarette pack to the man. Merci, he said, also without emotion or recognition. Then he took the cigarette from the pack and lit it with a match from his pocket. He then pulled the matches and the cigarette pack into his own packet and he moved on. Marie patiently finished her cigarette. She threw the stub in the river. Then she turned, scanning the sidewalk and the other side of the bridge. No one seemed to be noticing her. She quietly walked back to the shop. Not long after that day, Marie was working at the shop when two strange men came in. One spoke French and was easily Parisian, who asked for Madame Bouchard. The other looked sullen, and he said nothing. Marie realized immediately they must be connected to the resistance. She smiled and nodded and stepped through the door behind the counter. Madame, men for you, she whispered. <laughs> Madame Bouchard hurried out to the front. She quickly led the two men into the back room. Marie waited on a couple of customers who came and went from the shop. She was used to the resistance people coming and asking for Madame Bouchard, but the man who didn't speak seemed somehow different. His suit hadn't seemed to fit him all that well. There was something unsettling about him. Madame Bouchard came out of the back room. Take a break now, she said to Marie. I will watch the shop. I am waiting for a phone call. Then I must go to talk to some people. He cannot stay here all day. We must come up with a plan. I may be gone for a while. <clears throat> Marie nodded and went back into the room. The man who had not spoken was seated in the room's single chair. He was alone. The other man must have gone out the back door. The seated man looked inquisitively at Marie, and he didn't look so sullen anymore. Marie pulled a pack of cigarettes from her pocket. She took one out and started to light it before she realized she should offer one to the man. She held out the pack to him. Merci, he said, with a bad accent, bad French accent. Marie put the pack back in her pocket and struck a match, which she used to light both her cigarettes. The man took a long drag and coughed. <laughs> bloody French cigarettes, he said. <laughs> You're British, she said in English. She was surprised. Where did you come from? From the train station, he laughed. I don't ask me which one. And you sound American. I am. Well, blimey, what's a yank doing working in a bread shop in Paris and working for the resistance, too? I can certainly presume. Long story, she shrugged. What are you doing coming from the train station to us here? The man gave her a disarming smile. Well, I suppose it's safe to tell you, since you probably end up knowing anyway. He extended his hand. People call me Freddy. I'm a pilot with the RAF. 
Ah, your plane was shot down. No, not at all. I flew in three radio operators for your organization. We landed, fine, but we were ambushed. The plane was set on fire and everyone got away, but I got stuck here. Marie didn't comment and he continued. I spent a few days being hid out in a barn and then they put me on a train and brought me here to Paris. Doesn't make sense to me. They should be taking me to the border of some neutral country like Switzerland or Spain, but one of them told me all the trains go to Paris and from here they can send me on in any direction. I suppose they know I don't have much of a choice other than to trust you all, do I now? You can trust us here, Marie assured him. What's your name? Marie, and what part of America are you from? Boston. Freddie frowned. A lot of Irish in Boston, they tell me that anyway. Yes, I'm from South Boston. A lot of people have Irish ancestry there. Freddie seemed displeased. There's people with all kinds of ancestry in Boston. That's what America is all about. The North End is full of Italians. The original settlers were pretty much all English. Boston has plenty of their descendants, too. I'm not Irish. I'm not English or Italian. I'm an American. The flyer looked away. Is there something wrong? Don't like the Irish. <laughs> but I'm American, she repeated. My father was sent to Ireland in 1916, right in the middle of the Great War. They had a rebellion in Dublin. He was shot in the back by one of those bloody cowards. Bastards, everyone. Marie looked at him for a moment. She didn't know what to think. I'm sorry, I truly am, but I'm an American. I'm not one of them. <laughs> Freddie remained silent. There was a distance in his gaze. She found a little group of houses and shops with its church, just as Monsieur Claude, Claude had described it. It all reminded her of something out of some storybook. Again, she thought that if she didn't know it better, one would never imagine there was a war going on. Marie went up a few steps to the open door of the small country church. Pierre Richard was at the altar, busying himself with some papers he had spread out there. Marie walked down the center aisle and stopped at the altar rail. Pierre, she asked. He turned with a questioning look. You are, my dear? Marie figured she should use her resistance name. I am Antoinette. Ah, uh, yes, the older man said, as, he as if he recognized her. A visitor from Paris. We. Oui. she opened her purse and pulled out her cigarette pack and Madame Bouchard's letter as well. She handed the cigarette pack to the priest after glancing quickly around. They were completely alone. So she added, Inside, there is a message for you. We, oui, the priest nodded, and the cigarette pack disappeared quickly into a pocket of his cassock. There was a moment of silence. The priest glanced around as Marie had done. They were still alone in the church. They tell me you are American. We. Oui. Your country has not yet entered the war. We are waiting. We need your help. I don't have any influence on that. <laughs> the older man smiled. And there was something about that smile that reminded her of all the kindly old priests of her childhood. She hadn't had all that much contact with them, actually. But this man seemed to be one she could talk to. So she admitted, I don't pay much attention to politics. My role with you as a messenger was discovered in Paris. The Germans have my name, and I'm on the run. They sent me to help an RAF pilot find his way here. I know. I was told of your arrival. Marie didn't know whether to take that fact as good or bad. So, the plane came last night, and you were attacked. Then it flew off back to London. Yes, 
You have heard the latest. The plane did not land. The RAF man is still here. The priest looked troubled. Then he relaxed, and it turned to an expression of res resignation. I must read the message you brought me. I am sure it is a full report. There was a silence again. They were still alone. Marie decided to ask, can I ask you a question as a priest? I am a priest, please ask. Mm. Then she went ahead and poured out what was most on her mind. I don't know if you've heard this part or not, but last night I caused a man to be shot and killed. Everyone is telling me there is a war, but I must know if you think it is a sin. Ah, my child, tell me more. There is certainly a war. The circumstances are important. Marie quickly explained what had happened with Albert the night before, and the priest thought a moment before he replied. There is a special place in hell for traitors, my dear. I don't think our dear Lord would have any problem with what you did. Thank you, Father. Marie let out a long breath. Now I feel much better. Like everyone says nowadays, this is a war. This is not a game. That is exactly what Monsieur Claude told me. He is a wise man. Marie frowned. I don't like him much, she admitted. We need not like everyone we must follow. That part is part of war, too. Would you like me to give you absolution? Marie almost smiled. Oh, I don't know about that. I've done so many things in my life in Paris, and maybe even before, that I'm likely gone too far gone. <laughs> hmm. My child, no one is ever too far gone in the eyes of God. Well, we'll have to see. I don't think it. This will be the only message they'll send me with. I'll let you know. As you wish, the priest dismissed the matter with a wave of a hand. Good job. Mm -hmm. questions or at least attempt to. Um, but before I forget it, there are refreshments back there. Uh, a little coat to Rome if you, whoever gets to it first. <laughs> um, and um, some madeleines and cookies uh, baked by Jeannie just for this uh, occasion. And they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are French cookies, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. madeleines. Do you uh, know what? I mean, they're just French cookies. Mm -hmm. yeah. So something you would have found in the uh, bakery. Yes. Yes. Like cakey, yes. Cakey cookies. Yeah, cakey cookies. Oh. Yeah. So Bill, can you tell us? Um, have you spent time in France? Where did the inspiration for your story begin? Yeah, I've been to Paris about three times. Oh. Um, we chaperoned when Jeannie was teaching in high school. We got ourselves into this thing where we chaperoned a couple of student tours to Paris, and two of them went to there. You know, two of those were tours, and there was another time we took a trip over there that I was in Paris for, you know, a little bit, not not like a long time, but you know, long enough to get the feel of it and you know, understand what it was all about. I sort of think. Um, I was stage managing uh, Main Street Arts Cabaret, production of Cabaret, now a year and a half ago, uh, which, if you don't know, was, is set in uh, um, 1930s Berlin. And, you know, a lot of about Nazism is in that. And I had had this idea before about, um, you know, an art student in Paris who falls in with the resistance and that sort of just spurred me on to uh, go ahead and, and start writing this story. And, uh, you know, with the lockdown, I had plenty of time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I turned that out, and actually I've turned out the next book I'm going to have, which doesn't have anything to do with Paris. But, uh, I'm now working, though, on a sequel to this one. 
Um, oh. It picks up where she left off. And I won't say that, you have to find out. <laughs> Maybe should I? <laughs> it's, uh, well, I will. It's Casablanca, which um, everyone's seen the movie probably. All the research I make is the movie is nothing like the real Casablanca mm -hmm. in the 40s, but a couple of things like a bunch of refugees were there. And it's fascinating to me. Um, the United States was not in the war until, you know, Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941. So you had about at least a year and a half, maybe two years of the war, where the U.S. was a neutral country. And during that time, uh, Casablanca was a French colony, and um, the Vichy government of France, which was half of France after the occupation, it was the unoccupied part of France. They were in charge, and the U.S. consulate there was processing people's visas and all for all kinds of countries for these refugees, and it all involves that. It's a fascinating piece of history that most people don't know. And then in October of 1942, um, how many people even know this? Um, the Allies invaded um, North Africa. The British landed on the Mediterranean coast, but our Navy brought an entire invasion, of course, all the way from Norfolk, Virginia to Casablanca, totally undetected by the Germans. And uh, they landed north and south of this city, and that, that will be in that book, too. Wow. So, that's a long answer to one question. <laughs> I do. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So is this the first book that you didn't have pre-written that you actually wrote? Yeah, most of my other four books over here all um, all of them I had done parts of before. I mean the first one sort of was not I mean that was but it took me hundred and thirteen places submitting it to get it accepted by Wild Rose Press. Wow. Um, it's a long process. That was written in 2003. It was published in 2016. Um, the others were all ideas I had worked on before. Um, and, and, the, and the one that's what? coming out in the spring, or, or the one that the publisher has now, is a yeah. story that you wrote like a long time in 1992. I had an agent for that who was who only tried to sell it to the major publishers but was unsuccessful. Yeah, we have it. Once you meet with the publisher, do you stick with them? And they I, stick well, with you? I have. I have stuck with the Wildrose, yeah. but they, so I don't have to really submit any more of I have, I'm assigned to an editor, and I just send something new to that editor. And, you know, the four times I've done that, or five times I've done that, it's been accepted without question. Wow. Yeah, um, but I have another novel about a, a farm in Vermont in the 70s where marijuana is the cash crop. Really? And I've been in unable, the 70s? I, that's a little more literary, I think, and I've been unable to get that published, but I'm not trying to get that done by the Well Rose Press. They're a, a romance. They're a romance company, and I don't exactly write romances, but they do publish all different kinds of stories, but they're the, you know, the, their main thing is, is romance. So what did you Eileen is a romance writer, too, with a different company. What did you think of the two different processes? From, you know, having something that was written that you kind of like, you know, yeah, polished on, on and, and kind of... Um, I don't know, this one sort of flowed. Okay. It really did. Once I, uh, but I had the idea for a while. But once I started writing, I've seen a lot of World War II histories. I read a lot of history. I've read a lot of World War II We've history. seen every masterpiece theater. Yeah. During World War II. Yeah. Every single one. <laughs> Fun research. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and during lockdown, we, you know, we spend hours talking about, um, you know, the, you know, the, 
this, I, I actually kept saying, you should write a sequel, you should write a sequel. And he was, wasn't really sold on it, but he, he saw things my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they usually and do. once he got going on it, then it was, you know, once he started I, having yeah. all these ideas. A lot of people tell me, you should write a book about something. Okay, fine. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> but I need, uh, you know, about 49,000 words. <laughs> Idea is not going to cut it. Yeah, I think it really that. Yeah. Was so, it handy having Jeannie there for the French, have a, a French oh, yes, master yes. in the house? Oh, yes. yeah. She has oh. taught French yeah. and Spanish and now mm -hmm. teaches English, ESL, English is the second language. She was, you know, she has a degree in all three languages. So, ma femme parle français. I mean, if one wife speaks French and French. <laughs> <laughs> That's what got me through Paris. <laughs> now, I remember I, I walked into a, a place. I was by myself for a little bit, and I walked into this uh, place. To, at those days, it was traveler's checks. I wanted to catch a couple traveler's checks. And I looked at my little book, and I had it all down, you know. I want to cash a traveler's check, right? So I say that to this young woman behind the counter, and she just left.